inovação é um processo diversificado que envolve a organização em rede para acionar diferentes competências, a interação contínua entre fornecedores, clientes, empresas grandes e pequenas, startups e centros de pesquisa e academia, o compartilhamento de recursos, de custos e de riscos. Juntos, esses elementos compõem o ecossistema de inovação. O objetivo da sessão Ecossistemas de Inovação de Sucesso é compartilhar as forças dos ecossistemas aqui representados. Quais são seus pilares? Quão relevantes são as interações entre diferentes players num determinado lugar para o avanço da inovação? Para responder a estas e a outras perguntas, chamamos ao palco Chad Evans, vice-presidente executivo do Conselho de Competitividade dos Estados Unidos, Pedro Rocha Vieira, cofundador e CEO da Beta I de Portugal, Hannah Martinen Dickens, diretora sênior de ecossistemas e digital da Business Finland, da Finlândia, e Pierre Lucena, presidente da Porto Digital de Recife. O moderador será Ricardo Pellegrini, CEO e sócio fundador da Quantum 4 Soluções de Inovação. E é com ele que damos início a esta sessão. Bom, boa tarde a todos. É, eu queria parabenizar inicialmente o CNI e o SEBRAE pelo oitavo Congresso de Inovação e agradecer o convite para mediar esse painel. É, nós, esse é um tema super importante que nós podemos dizer que ele não é novo. Inovação aberta é algo que é tudo aquilo que não é interno da empresa. Né? E nós vamos falar aqui do desenvolvimento do ecossistema. E, tradicionalmente, a gente já vem trabalhando isso antes da explosão das startups. Ou seja, como que você colabora com seus fornecedores, com seus clientes, né? até no pré-competitivo, com seus competidores, Agora, após a criação das startups, essa explosão das startups, o empreendedorismo que explodiu em todo o mundo, inclusive aqui no Brasil, a gente viu o desenvolvimento cada vez maior desse ecossistema, que são os atores que atuam ao redor desse tema de inovação. E hoje a gente pode dizer que é fundamental que você tenha um ecossistema forte, envolvido na tua empresa, na tua sociedade, e os países hoje competem por esses casos. Competem por essas células ou por esse ecossistema integrado. Quanto maior a gente vai ver, que maior é o nível de inovação que você consegue trazer. E é por isso que a gente trouxe esse tema para esse painel. E nós trouxemos aqui alguns casos que são representativos fora do Brasil e um caso brasileiro, que talvez nem todo mundo conheça, mas é só para dizer que no Brasil a gente também faz esse, esse estímulo e esse investimento em ecossistemas de inovação, e nós trouxemos um dos casos. Então, para cá, nós trouxemos quatro exemplos. É, nós trouxemos um exemplo da Finlândia, um exemplo de Portugal, um exemplo que é dos Estados Unidos e um exemplo do Brasil. Então, eu queria introduzir aqui os, os quatro painelistas. É, o primeiro deles é da Betaí, é de Portugal, é o Pedro Rocha Vieira, ele é o CEO e co-founder da Betaí. A Business Finland é outra que veio da Finlândia, é, outra, é uma entidade, na verdade, que trabalha com esses sistemas na Finlândia. E quem veio para cá é a Hannah Martinen Dickens, que é diretora sênior de ecossistema e transformação digital. É, dos Estados Unidos, o Council of Competitiveness dos Estados Unidos, é o Chad Evans, que é vice-presidente executivo, e é um grande parceiro, a gente tem que dizer, a, o, Forum, o Council of Competitiveness é, da MEI, nas imersões que a gente faz ao redor do mundo, nos Estados Unidos, tem nos apoiado já há alguns anos. É, e do Brasil, nós trouxemos o Porto Digital, que é de Recife, o Pierre Lucena, que é o presidente. Então, para as nossas considerações iniciais, eu pediria aqui, vamos começar pelo Pedro, da Betaí de Portugal. 
para comentar um pouco o que, que a Betaí faz e um pouquinho da sua história, para que nós vamos fazer isso com os quatro, primeiro para ter uma introdução e depois nós vamos fazer aqui um, uma interação para que a gente possa fazer um pouco um ping-pong aqui de perguntas e respostas. Então, Pedro, por favor, obrigado aí pela presença. Sim. Boa tarde. Um, I'll, I'll, speak, I'll, speak, I'll speak in English because of my fellow <laughs> panelists. So, th thank you so much for the invitation to be here. So, my name is Pedro Rocha Vieira. I'm the CEO of BTE. Uh, I come to Portugal. And it's a pleasure to be t here talking about ecosystems because 10 years ago, we, we were founding BTE in Portugal, in, in Lisbon, a small country. Um, and we, we did this with the idea of uh, making Lisbon truly a global innovation ecosystem. And we wanted to support the next generation of entrepreneurs and also to help a lot of the, the corporations and also the organizations to, on their uh, human-centric uh, transformation processes. And we, we, we knew that uh, we were in the, in the middle of the big crisis in 2009 You, we had just after the, the global crisis, Portugal was a mess. And, and so we decided to do something. And we, we knew that this would take a long time. Uh, usually ecosystems take 10, 20 years to develop. Um, and we knew that this had to be led by, by entrepreneurs and by, by independent players. So we start by creating a, a non-profit organization, which is Better E, and to uh, help lead this transformation. And we also felt that you had to be very inclusive and very collaborative. So we tried to involve as many uh, uh, players as possible from the whole ecosystem because everyone was very, very scattered. And so uh, one of the big things that the, a crisis does is that puts everything in perspective. So the big corporations, the big to, to fail, they collapsed. And, and this creates a, a, a very good opportunity to change mindsets and to change the culture of a country. And so everyone was a bit of panicking and we decided that no, we're going to invest in Portugal, we're going to believe that we can be in 10 years a great place to innovate. And we, the first thing that we did was, was to focus a lot on, on talent. So we needed to have talent in order to, to attract and to build an ecosystem. Portugal had a very good Uh, university systems, but we lacked a lot of, uh, of uh, more expert people. So we, we tried to, to engage with a lot of the diaspora, with all the, the generation that went to Erasmus programs, which is a uh, exchange program in, at European level. And, and uh, also we tried to do a lot of reforms uh, with universities and to train a lot of, a lot of the um, of um, a lot of the talent that was in Portugal. So by attracting this, this talent to Portugal, we start to have a different kind of mindset. And in this, another thing that helped a lot was Portugal, uh, although in crisis, it became very popular in terms of tourism. So we started attracting a lot of people from abroad, visiting the country, and this brought, made Lisbon a much more Uh, cosmopolitan city, a much more uh, open city, and this is very, very important to create the, the right ingredients to, to, to start changing the, the culture. And so, the second thing is we did was we and the, knew that we had to create more density, because without density, there's uh, things don't emerge. So the first thing we did was we went throughout the, the world and made partnerships with everyone. So we brought Startup Weekend and uh, Uh, Seed Camp and Founders Institute and TEDx's and Y Combinator and everything to, to Portugal because we really felt that we had to have these connections and these, these initiatives in Portugal. And then we started by doing our own programs. We created our uh, idea stage uh, accelerators like Ready to Start. We start doing our pre-accelerators, Better Start. We then launched the first equity-based accelerator called Lisbon Challenge which is now uh, one of the top 10 programs in Europe, uh, and that was very important. We also did a lot of events to create density. You have to bring 
every, all the players together, the investors, the government, corporations, uh, entrepreneurs. So we, we did a lot of big events, small events, big events. We brought TEDx and then we, we started to do uh, Explorers Festival. And now our bigger event is uh, the Lisbon Investment Summer, which uh, was last week. Uh, and this brings entrepreneurs from, uh, and investors from all over the world. And also, Another thing that we understood is that the density had to be not only in startups, but also had to be in corporations. So we start doing a lot of open innovation programs. We were one of the first to do this at the European level. And, and today we have, I think, more than 40 programs that we, we do, we've done so far. Uh, more than 15 programs every year in many different sectors. And, and this was, has been very, very important to create density of startups and innovation also in, in organizations, big organizations. We also opened a very big uh, hub, a place, a co-working and incubator. This is very important for people to gather and to student PT to, to happen. Now it's a common thing, but back then was not, was not so, 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 so common. And we also th knew that the density had to be not only at the Portuguese level, but also at the European and the global level. So we did a lot of partnerships, international partnerships, especially at the European Union. We were the founders of the first European Accelerators Network, so that brought the industry of accelerators together. We also created the first the European Startups Network, a light for startups, so a lot of initiatives that were bringing different players around, the, and, and around Europe. With that, we created startup, startup exchange, we, we exchanged of staff between different accelerators. This was really, really good for, for creating a, 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 a new culture. Um, we also supported a lot of governments uh, in their transformations and policies. We helped also bring initiatives like the Web Summits to Portugal. And, and then we focus a lot on culture. Uh, culture is very important. So the crisis was really important to, to, to create an opportunity to change. But then we had to, to talk much more of examples of entrepreneurs. So we talked a lot with media. We brought entrepreneurs to, to become the, really the, the new heroes of this transformation. And um, we also created a, a startup manifesto. Uh, and we joined the European Startup and Manifesto. This was very important also in creating a new culture for people to really understand what is this of startups, what is uh, innovation, what is uh, a lot of these concepts that people a lot of times don't, don't understand. And, and uh, bringing, bringing as much as possible communication between these, these different players. Um, right now, Portugal has a, has a good, good culture of innovation but we, we, we are losing some, 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 some competitiveness, so it's very important to keep this momentum. Because usually when the economy uh, starts to grow, the economy starts to grow, uh, sometimes this push and pulls out uh, talents and resources from the, the, the ecosystem. And finally, we also focus a lot in capital. So to have investors, professional investors, is really important. So we created a, a, a global network of, of investors that we attracted to Portugal. We created Lisbon Investment Summit, Business Angel Summits. We also did a lot of demo days, investor days. We organized an investors academy to train professional investors because everyone wants to invest in startups, but there's a lot of people doing mistakes and stupid things in the, in the startup world. So it's very important to train new angels, new VCs, and also new limited partners that can uh, invest in the ecosystem. We also brought a lot of uh, uh, early stage investors from all over the world and, and worked a lot with the government to create the right incentives for, for investment. Right now, Portugal has a lot of foreign investment and uh, has a lot of also money from the government to, to, to promote investments. And, and lastly, I think the, the, the one thing that a lot of times we, we neglect is regulation. So there's a lot of laws that can jeopardize the competitiveness of an ecosystem. So we lobbied a lot with the government both at the Portuguese level and at the, at the European level to change some laws uh, like GPDR, like the copy, copyright law, so that Portugal and Europe would lo lose, lose competitiveness uh, compared with other ecosystems. So, yeah, so now Portugal is really is booming and, uh, and uh, we, we also feel that this experience that we had in the last 10 years 
and now with the with the web summit also in Portugal and putting uh, Portugal in the radar, we we are now also try taking this experience to other ecosystems. So we are working in other countries in Europe. We are also working in uh, in uh, Africa uh, and uh, Asia, and also now having some of the first steps here in Brazil. So I'm I'm sure that I'm going to be have the opportunity to answer too many more questions. Excelente, excelente. Obrigado, Pedro. Uh, Hannah. Você poderia, por favor, dizer, falar um pouquinho sobre Business Finland e como vocês começaram e o estágio que estão agora? Por favor. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, so maybe a few, swor few words in the beginning about Finland as such and why um, I was invited to come here. Um, I think some of me might not know that despite of a very small size of, of Finland with only 5 million population, we'd be very privileged in the sense that uh, we've been topping most of the international ratings, looking at the growth and development in the economic, technological and social spheres uh, for quite some time already. Our government is very business friendly, infrastructure is well developed, and we have skilled workforce and competitive operating costs. Um, but foremost, our country has very vibrant uh, ecosystems, business and innovation ecosystems in different sectors. And these aim to maximize the benefits of research, networking and international cooperation. But have we always been doing this well? And we, will we continue to do this well in the future? In the future, well, definitely not, unless we continuously innovate and renew ourselves with partners from different parts of the world. And what comes to the past, uh, no, not really. We have actually come a long way from what we used to be to what we are today. And uh, what we tried to do, though, is that throughout the years, we have tried to understand that what would be the, key, be the key elements in fostering this kind of economic growth and social welfare in the society. And we have tried to adopt and to understand how to adopt to the rapid changes in the environment and uh, the surroundings, not just in Finland, but also internationally. I would now like to highlight some of the learnings that we have gained ourselves uh, throughout the years and how we are now trying to adjust ourselves to the future of data-driven economies, which I believe is something that all of us should be doing and something that I'm sure that is also on the agenda of many of you here from the Brazilian business sector. Uh, talking about the Finnish learnings, I would also like to undermine that uh, no country is exactly the same. So what works in Finland doesn't necessarily work here. However, the more we share the experiences, the more we debate the different outcomes and different options, I believe that the better all of us will be going to the future. And the future that we're heavily looking at in Finland is really a future of digitally trusted societies. So digital innovation ecosystems are really the key into this digital transformation of a society. Uh, we consider that as an integration of digital technologies into all areas of business, fundamentally changing how you operate your business and deliver value to the customers. And this is the case both for the public sector as well as to the private sector. But it's also cultural change. You have to fundamentally change your thinking on how you operate and how you deliver value to customers. What does this do? This actually requires a really, a cult, a really a continued change of the status quo. You need to experiment. You need to get used to failures as well. Artificial intelligence is one of the key technologies driving us forward with the fourth industrial revolution. So is the underlying digital infrastructure, soon preferably being 5G. These together with data mobility, trust, platform economy, and ethics, as well as digital competencies across the whole work of the society, are really the key areas of our digital economies to, to, to prosper. 
and startups as a very important engine of growth in this uh, digital transformation. Innovation and investment in research development have a huge direct linkage to economic productivity and employment growth. Um, I just checked that in our own little country, two-thirds of our productivity growth was innovation driven. But let me now briefly um, just go through a couple of elements that we believe uh, are very important in fostering innovation ecosystems and subsequent growth. First is, and these are no priority order by the way, so first is supportive legislation. That's one of the key roles of the public sector to adopt legislation to support innovation ecosystems. I'll give you an example. Last year, uh, the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications changed the law that enable, enabled uh, a big part of the Baltic Sea along the Finnish west coast to operate and test unmanned ships. So that was kind of the final step in creation of an autonomous shipping ecosystem back in the country. Another example is very new, it just happened last month, where a legislation enables secondary use of individual health data, which gave a huge boost to, to a health, digital health ecosystem. The second element is availability of RDNI funding, be it then public or private. But it's important because it, it lowers the risk, the lowers the risk for failure. And when it does that, it enables companies, especially startups, but also the larger ones, to try. Try without being uh, uh, worried about the potential failures. The third one is open innovation economy, environment, sorry. It's very important to foster trust-based collaboration between different players on the society. Because if you don't have trust, and will to collaborate, there will simply no be any innovation ecosystems. The fourth one is a national strategy. On the digital innovation and growth, it is adamant. It sets the framework and it empowers all players in the society, so the government, the public and the private sector, and, and the academia. And uh, I have a number of examples of that, but I will talk about this maybe later, uh, if there's a possibility. So last but not least, um, what are the kind of innovation ecosystems that can then be fostered through these four uh, basic elements that I mentioned? I would pick up two main ones, and they are very interlinked together. The first one is startup ecosystems. These foster the incubation and acceleration of startups. Um, as an example, for example, um, I can take from home ground, XEDU. It's Europe's largest um, accelerator for edtech startups, creating transformative learning solutions with pedagogical impact. Or there's the European Space Agency's business uh, acceleration, or incubator rather, for space-related and new space economy companies. Or there's Maria.io, which is becoming Euro's largest startup campus with over 650 early to later stage startups. What's so unique about these startup ecosystems and what's very important to remember, something what the previous speaker was also talking about, is that they are all teaming up with global industry leaders to create world's leading ecosystems on an open innovation basis. The second type of ecosystem, which is my last point now, is the business innovation ecosystems. These are really the cornerstones of the Finnish approach to digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution. I will give you just one example now. It's called Reboot IoT Factory. And interesting here is that, and I think this could be something very interesting for Brazil as well, how factories can become innovation platforms. So the Finnish learnings here are how to, uh, they're, they're aiming at how to enable truly innovation-driven ecosystems that have global reach. 
It includes forerunner factories, such as ABB from the energy sector, Nokia from the connectivity space, GE from healthcare, Ponce from harvesting machinery, and uh, Rolls-Royce uh, or Kungsberg these days on the shipping sector. It also includes a number of startups and SMEs from the IoT side as well as some top-class research institutions. So what do they do? The reboot model of operation is based on co-creation with actual production environments. Each of these forerunner factories acts as a research and development platform, as well as reference customer for selected SMEs. This gives these uh, Finnish or foreign companies based in Finland, these IoT SMEs, solution providers, the competitive push that they will need to succeed in the international markets. And these factories, these big players on the other hand, they advance in their digitalization strategies and gain business advantage from adopted IoT solutions. The model is executed through series of sprints and continuous sharing of experiences and that ensures a dynamic and very flexible method of operation. And the close-knit operation and the open innovation uh, here really enables fast utilization of transferable uh, best practices across all of these players. And this, I think, is something that could be easily applied to any industrial sector, from banking to agriculture, to transportation, for example. But maybe I stop here so that others can have uh, their part. Thanks. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, now, Chad. Why don't you start, Chad? Thanks, Ricardo. Is this working? I think so. Um, well, I want to maybe start with a little bit of an explanation about who I am, where I work, and what I'm doing here. Um, I'm privileged to work in an organization based in Washington, D.C. called the Council on Competitiveness. We are a 33-year-old, nonpartisan, nonprofit movement of leaders committed to ensuring the United States has long-term productivity growth, inclusive prosperity, and success of our goods and services in the global marketplace. We are the brainchild of one of the most creative CEOs in the United States, a gentleman named John Young who in 1986, when he was CEO of Hewlett Packard, created us. And he created us for a very specific reason. In 1986, the United States was really at a major inflection point in its history, facing tremendous competitive challenge from the exports engines of Japan and then West Germany. So there was a real ferment in the country, what are we gonna do about competitiveness in the United States? So that's who we are, and for the past three decades, we've been working to, in some sense, answer that question and to provide answers for not only Americans as a whole, as a general population, but for our, obviously our policymakers. So why here? Why are we in Brazil today? We're in Brazil because we have been focused alongside our partners at CNI on a, a huge journey over the past 10 to 20 years on innovation. Why are we focused on innovation? If you look at our research, and of course the research of many others across the world, innovation has been the single most important factor in the success of the U.S. economy over the past century. So our enduring challenge in the United States is how do we continue to unleash that innovation capacity? Especially at a moment, and I want to be a little bit provocative here, at a moment when we are facing what I would call an existential crisis to our nation's innovation capability and competitiveness. Now, what do I mean by existential crisis? In just the past few years, the nature and context for innovation has shifted radically around the world, as well as in the United States. The DNA of innovation has continued to evolve, and the American innovation ecosystem is facing new multipolar challenges, as well as a host of new opportunities that we have to seize if we want to continue to prosper in the 21st century. I want to talk a little bit about some of these challenges and opportunities and what we as a council and our members are doing about it. Um, for example, there are many signs that the U.S. innovation engine is stalling or has stalled. If you look at our GDP growth over the past decade, 
it has been, at least over the past few years, it's actually a little bit slower than it had been a few decades before. Why is that happening? Now, if you do look at our GDP growth, what you see is that a lot of the contribution to that growth has come from labor input. But if you look at the GDP growth of some of our major competitors, it is being driven by multi-factor productivity, innovation. Why is that not happening in the United States? Why is it happening in other countries? Let's look at another trend. U.S. innovation investment and infrastructure is also under threat. Let's just look at our R&D enterprise. At current growth rates, China will overtake the United States and its annual total R&D investment by the end of this decade. China will also overtake the United States in terms of its R&D intensity, the investment in R&D as a percent of GDP, by the end of this decade. Well, by the end of the decade is today. <laughs> we are at the end of that decade. So that is what I mean by an existential crisis. And let me just dive a little bit deeper and choose a global competitor, but why don't I just stick with China? It's um, perhaps the most uh, challenging example facing the United States. As everyone here knows, China is aggressively creating the world's first fully intelligentized, that's the word they created, infrastructure. What do I mean by intelligentized infrastructure? A couple of examples. One, China is providing today 20 billion U.S. dollars to support its integrated circuit industry. Every person in this room, every industry, every con company, every organization is completely dependent upon trusted microelectronics. China is aiming at the heart of the core technology of our long-term innovation and productivity potential. Two. China is outpacing the world, and particularly the United States, in its investments in artificial intelligence. Plans on the books today to invest $150 billion in artificial intelligence. What's the official U.S. plan? One one-hundredth of that, just a little under $2 billion. Magnitude order of difference. Three, China is closing the gap with the United States and trying to dominate um, other technologies like CRISPR-Cas9. China's Made in China effort is committing $3 billion to advanced manufacturing efforts, dwarfing the United States' own Manufacturing USA effort. And then finally, China is keeping pace and in some years outpacing the United States in its high-performance computing capability. At the moment, the United States has the world's fastest supercomputer. Two years ago, that wasn't the case. If you look at the top 500 systems, 44% of those systems are Chinese. This is what I mean by existential threat. In addition, the nature of innovation itself is changing. It's increasingly, and you heard this from my CEO, Deborah Wynn Smith, in the panel before, innovation is increasingly turbulent, transforming, transitioning, digital, biotech, cognitive, nanotech, these are all colliding, converging to create new opportunities but also new challenges. And this innovation capacity is exploding exponentially. The pace of change is disruptive, it is nonlinear, and it is being driven by the substantial cost reductions in compute power, storage, internet usage. This is radically transforming every industry that's represented in this room today. And the United States is facing fundamental changes in how it pursues innovation. Today, a young woman can be in her garage and develop and deploy and scale valuable innovation, completely ignoring the traditional institutions of innovation. Today, the link between production and capital is being broken. We see an increased pace of innovation because of the collapsing of disciplines, sciences, and domains. This is completely rewriting the way in which we think about innovation. And let's just look at one of those trends, the democratization of innovation. Now, the opportunity is that innovation um, that's open and increasingly democratized is allowing everyone in this room to look externally as much as internally for their innovation. Now, the challenge in the U.S. case is that experts believe our innovation, open innovation system, is increasingly exclusionary, not inclusionary. So the United States cannot possibly be a global benchmark for innovation if we do not have a population that is able to take advantage of the opportunities of innovation, if that 
population is decreasing and shrinking. So what are we doing about it at the Council on Competitiveness? Um, our challenge is really clear. How do we optimize our society for innovation? And we think we have a really bold and aggressive answer. On August 7th, we will launch in Washington, D.C., an all-of-nation national commission on the future of innovation and competitiveness. This is an effort that will involve hundreds of leaders across the United States for the next three to five years to define a new innovation agenda for the country. It will be representative of companies large and small, labor, industry, academia, national labs, venture, angel, everything. We have a bold plan to completely rewrite the innovation code in the United States. We have three major pillars that we'll focus on in our first year. One is we will engage leaders across of America to think of new recommendations of how do we develop and deploy and commercialize at scale disruptive technologies. The second pillar, how do we sustainably produce, consume, and work in the 21st century? And our third and final pillar for our first year will be how do we really create the best system for innovation? And by system, I mean the interlinked and interlocked web of regulations, standards, capital cost structure, intellectual property protections, trade positioning, everything, the, the business environment that makes innovation happen. So these are going to be the fundamental pillars of our new commission. Um, it will be um, a major national effort. First results, December 2019. Be on the lookout for those. And of course, I'll just end with the point, the reason we're here with CNI and our partners we know that innovation is global. We have a national agenda, but we're looking to learn from the best around the world, and we want to share our practices with others, too. That's great. Obrigado, Chad. Pierre, por que você não conta um pouco a história do Porto Digital? E só um detalhe, eu comentei com o Pierre, quando era executivo da IBM, eu visitei o Porto Digital em 2002. E eles tinham dois anos de idade, se não me engano. Então, realmente, é uma iniciativa que está há muito tempo e eu acho que tem muita gente aqui no Sudeste que, eventualmente, já ouviu falar, mas não tem todos os detalhes. Eu acho que era super importante a gente trazer uma iniciativa que está um pouco distante da gente aqui no Sudeste, mas que é de grande sucesso. Bom, primeiro, boa tarde a todos. Obrigado pelo convite. Só contando um pouco da história do Porto Digital, nós surgimos há 18 anos e o Porto Digital é um parque urbano e aberto. Quando eu estou falando aberto, ele não tem basicamente um terreno como áreas de parques industriais conhecidos ou mesmo de parques tecnológicos, a gente optou por ocupar o centro do Recife, o centro antigo, na verdade, que a gente conhece como Recife Antigo, que é a área onde o Recife surgiu e onde ocorre é, o carnaval. Nós surgimos lá atrás, foi no final, na verdade, da década de 90 que veio a ideia, a abertura foi só no ano de 2000, mas com o objetivo básico de dar emprego aos jovens que estavam saindo da Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. Nós éramos uma universidade que já formava muita gente na área de tecnologia, mas ainda não tinha o um espaço para que esses jovens fossem trabalhar. E a gente começou com essa ideia ingênua, com apenas duas empresas, foi formada uma governança é, entre o Estado, as universidades e a iniciativa privada, que foi justamente o Porto Digital, que é uma organização social. Nós não somos uma empresa, mas também não somos órgão do setor público, nós somos uma organização social com um conselho com 19 pessoas, dos quais o Estado só participa é, com quatro assentos. O Estado financiou, no início, a sua operação através da cessão de prédios que nós alugamos, e é isso que faz sustentar o núcleo de gestão do Porto Digital, do qual eu sou o presidente. Como eu disse, nós começamos com duas empresas no ano de 2000. Hoje, o, o Porto Digital tem 328 empresas dentro do seu parque, quase 10 mil pessoas trabalhando na área de tecnologia e 800 empreendedores é, dentro dessa área do Recife Antigo. Né? 328 empresas, quase 10 mil é, pessoas trabalhando, 800 empreendedores dentro dessa, dessa área. O objetivo que eu tenho, eu assumi o parque em novembro do ano passado, é, o objetivo que eu tenho é de dobrar o tamanho do Porto Digital num prazo de cinco a seis anos, é, no número de pessoas, basicamente. Então, a gente quer chegar a 20 mil trabalhadores na área de tecnologia, lá em Recife, no Porto Digital. É, nós estamos trabalhando, basicamente, com três grandes eixos de atuação 
que é onde os parques tecnológicos, basicamente, precisam estar, né? essa governança. O primeiro deles, que é um fator crítico, que são pessoas, essa é uma indústria intensiva de mão de obra, então, se você tiver, que tem uma demanda muito grande atualmente, e se você tiver gente para trabalhar, a gente está partindo desse princípio. Tendo gente para trabalhar, a demanda acaba chegando. Então, esse é um, esse é um fato relevante para nós. O segundo grande eixo é um eixo da rede de negócios e de inovação. É preciso fortalecer essa rede de negócios, aumentar o número de empresas e a, a, aumentar, na verdade, é o número de interações que se faz e os mercados que se abrem. E o terceiro grande eixo que a gente trabalha é justamente o da recuperação urbana, né, do território. Para você ter um cluster fortalecido, é fundamental que você se estabeleça dentro de um território e no qual nós estamos no bairro do Recife, né, no centro do Recife. A gente sofreu uma expansão para dois outros bairros, também na área central é, da cidade, mas nós estamos localizados principalmente no Recife Antigo, que é o bairro onde nós escolhemos para se estabelecer. Então, o Porto Digital ele é um projeto econômico de geração de emprego e renda, mas ele também é um projeto de cidade, é um projeto de regeneração do tecido central urbano, que, seria, que é a área onde seria hoje a Cracolândia do Recife, com certeza. É uma área próxima ou parecida com o que seria a área da luz aqui em São Paulo, mas é uma experiência muito bem sucedida. No ano passado, a gente ganhou o Prêmio Nacional do IFAM de Recuperação de Áreas Históricas, é através de um projeto privado, e de, um projeto de recuperação urbana, feito basicamente pelas empresas. Né? O Porto Digital faz a regeneração de vários prédios, mas a, a compra de, de prédios é, através da iniciativa privada é que faz, basicamente, toda a diferença. Eu queria alertar um fato de que é, esse primeiro eixo que eu falei, que é o eixo das pessoas, né? é um eixo fundamental é, de trabalho nosso, porque para a gente chegar a mais 10 mil pessoas, hoje a gente tem 10 mil, basicamente, chegar a mais 10 mil pessoas parece que é fácil, mas não é. Eu posso dar alguns números aqui que impressionam a qualquer pessoa. Por exemplo, São Paulo forma um pouco mais do que mil pessoas em ciência da computação. Apenas. Veja, o estado de São Paulo todo forma um pouco mais de mil pessoas e é o curso core de um parque tecnológico. Logo, você tem engenharia da computação, é fundamental, é outro sistema de informação, mas ciência da computação é justamente o principal curso. Só para termos uma ideia da comparação, e como o Brasil vem formando errado, a gente tem mais alunos, ou tem menos alunos de ciência da computação no somatório do Estado de São Paulo todo do que de direito na FMU, que é uma só universidade aqui do Estado. A gente forma é, o Nordeste todo, para ter uma ideia, tem 13 mil estudantes de ciência da computação contra 191 mil estudantes de direito. A gente não vai construir esse país sendo um país de bacharel. A gente, se a gente quisesse colocar no século XXI, definitivamente, é preciso que a gente coloque a formação e a educação na pauta do dia de maneira prioritária, coisa que o país não vem fazendo. A gente tem... Simplesmente a educação vai ficando para depois, e isso é uma história que a gente já vem, já vem assistindo. No caso de Pernambuco, a gente teve, que é o estado onde está o Porto Digital, a gente teve uma ação é, muito fortalecida do estado através da educação pública. Pernambuco, para quem não sabe, é quem tem a maior nota média no IDEB é, de, ensino, de ensino médio das escolas públicas no Brasil. Isso tem feito toda a diferença para a gente. Né? Então, é, se a gente quiser buscar a saída e quiser colocar o Brasil definitivamente na rota da inovação no século XXI, ou a gente trabalha definitivamente é, o tema da educação, ou a gente vai ficando para trás. Não tem outra saída. Já em relação à, à rede de negócios, só citando algumas, para concluir, citando algumas das empresas que estão lá no Porto Digital, para as pessoas terem a noção do que, que a gente conseguiu fazer estando numa área periférica em um país periférico, a gente sempre tem que lembrar isso, dentro do ponto digital estão hoje a IBM, a Microsoft, o Uber, a Fiat Chrysler, a Fiat Chrysler, por exemplo, faz toda a plataforma do Jeep, da Jeep para o mundo todo, lá dentro do ponto digital. A gente tem a empresa líder de segurança da informação, que é a Tempest, e mais um conjunto significativo de companhias, como, por exemplo, a Accenture, que tem 2.500 pessoas, 2.500 pessoas trabalhando lá dentro do Porto Digital com seu centro de inovação. 
E na rede de empreendedorismo, que a gente, na verdade, trabalha isso já há algum tempo, tem quatro casos que eu acho importante citar, de empresas que saíram de incubadoras nossas, mas que hoje, na verdade, estão faturando lá pela casa de 100 milhões de reais. Que é a Tempest, que é a empresa líder de, de segurança da informação, que tem o Bradesco e o Itaú, a BBC e a The Economist como clientes, por exemplo. A Neurotec, que é uma empresa que foi incubada também lá no CESA, que hoje já fatura mais de 100 milhões de reais. A Inloco Media, que vai ser a nossa primeira unicórnio, provavelmente, também foi incubada nossa. E uma empresa de economia criativa, que foi nossa incubada, que é a Mr. Plot, que quem é pai aqui conhece, que é quem fez o Mundo Bita, que é um, um, uma animação extremamente conhecida. Todos esses foram exemplos de que saíram de lá, de um parque no Recife, que foi feito com muito pouco dinheiro público, e que hoje não recebe mais recurso público, que já consegue se sustentar apenas com projetos ou com um aluguel de espaço, mas que foi possível fazer um projeto a partir, obviamente, da determinação de um conjunto de pessoas que participavam do governo, da universidade, da iniciativa privada, que conseguiram se colocar e ultrapassar governos. Esse é um projeto de Estado participando da iniciativa privada e que conseguiu colocar o Recife numa rota que provavelmente ele não estaria se não fosse a determinação de um certo conjunto de pessoas. É isso. Obrigado. Muito obrigado. E aqui, Pierre, só pegando o seu comentário aqui da, da STEAM e formar o pessoal em ciência e tecnologia, né, engenharia, etc., aqui só um depoimento da MEI, nós estamos muito conectados com isso, tanto que a gente trabalhou a, junto com o MEC, na verdade, na reformulação aí da, da agenda da engenharia, que foi anunciado recentemente, foi algo que a gente fez aí a quatro mãos, e tanto que a gente tem realmente o foco, e a gente gostou muito hoje de manhã, o Júlio Semeghini falou sobre foco também em STEAM, é, como forma realmente do desenvolvimento. O desenvolvimento tecnológico e, portanto, de carreiras que sejam mais ligadas a essa área de ciência, tecnologia, é, engenharia, etc., matemática, são fundamentais, porque senão a gente não tem a mão de obra. Né? O, o, um grande investidor, aí, o investidor Stone, do Sequoia, disse que uma das razões pelas quais ele não investe no Brasil, como um grande venture capital, que é a Sequoia, é porque a gente não forma mão de obra em STEAM suficiente. Né? A gente forma uma fração muito pequena comparado, por exemplo, com os Estados Unidos, com com China, etc. Então, só para corroborar com esse seu ponto. Agora, um dos debates que a gente tem aqui no Brasil frequentemente é qual é a participação de governo nessas iniciativas. E eu queria perguntar, na origem e hoje, qual é a participação que o governo teve e tem ainda nas iniciativas que vocês é, tem hoje em andamento. Então, lá na Beta, você como cofundador, como é que foi no início a participação de governo? Em duas dimensões, quer dizer, o governo ajudou com algum direcionamento e ou funding, e hoje, como é que é essa participação de governo nessas dimensões também? Pedro, por favor. Okay. Uh, I'll keep it okay? uh, o governo foi muito supportive, mas more in words <laughs> in the beginning. So we, I'm an entrepreneur, so it's a, like a startup. Today we have 65 people in the team that we have to pay salaries. Um, but in the, in the beginning was, was, was tough. The first two years we almost didn't have any income. We, we didn't, it was, everything was done because there was entrepreneurs focused on making this happen. Um, but then, so the government didn't invest a lot in us in the beginning, just supported. But then they gave some sponsorships for some accelerators, like the Lisbon Challenge, from some events. But then what they became, they became clients. So on open innovation, so we manage a lot of programs for the government, like in tourism, and also for municipalities. So we manage the open innovation program of the city of Lisbon. We manage the open innovation uh, program of the, the Ministry of Ocean for, uh, for the, the, the ocean economy. We, we manage uh, with city halls like in retail and logistics. So now they, are, they become our clients. So, but it's not a sponsorship and we don't have any, any kind of grants. 
Uh, then we, we've applied also to, at the European level, we applied to some grants, uh, competitive ones in consortiums, that we, we got some public funding. But I would say that 90% of our income comes from services. And our business model is a mix of uh, innovation services, uh, a mix of uh, events, so we do, we do a lot of tickets, we sell tickets, sponsorship from, co from corporate clients, we also do a lot of training and education, so we charge for that. Uh, we have uh, uh, incubators, so we also charge f uh, startups for that. And on the side, we created a, a VC fund, so also we are investors. We are one of the biggest uh, early stage investors in Portugal. We have over 50 startups. And as an LP, the government uh, is a big LP, so they, they, they fund 45% of the, of the fund. But as but we have to return the money. Uh, and so we also gain some managing fees. So I believe the, the government has, can, should have a role in, in uh, uh, filling some gaps of the ecosystem. It's very difficult, the accelerator business, and to uh, capacitate entrepreneurs in the early stage. It's a very difficult business model. And if you see almost everywhere, all the accelerators are collapsing. Uh, so if you don't have a VC arm on the, uh, on the side, and if you don't open innovation services, it's very difficult to, to be sustainable. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think the, the role of government has to be to create more incentives, as to create also, uh, to bring together uh, public-private partnerships and creating big consortiums around relevant clusters and to, f to, f to create initiatives that are mostly uh, funded by private partners, but th they are boosted by the, the by the government as well to create some critical mass, which is very important. And and but I, I believe a lot that government has has uh, mainly the power is on regulation regulation to make uh, things much more easier, and to create the right incentives for for the the corporates and investors to invest. If you, for example, if you would allow that open innovation programs would be uh, considered as, as innovation and subsidized by, uh, so you could dedu deduct that on the taxes from the corporate side, this would be very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. Um, and also, in terms of investment, I believe that it's important that the government is a, is a funds of funds in the beginning. But I think the, the most important is, again, to create the, in, the incentives for, for, for LPs to come to the table. OK, obrigado, Pedro. Hanna, how was, in uh, your case, in Finland? How much was the participation or not and, uh, nowadays? OK, so um, maybe I just say in the beginning that Business Finland is a governmental innovation and uh, international collaboration agency. So maybe I'm a little bit biased of saying what should be the role of government from that perspective. But um, no, seriously speaking, I really think that um, we should think about it as a, a collaboration, as a teamwork. So each country or, or region, if you want that way, should have the uh, common uh, innovation strategy. Uh, for example, in my line of work, we have a digital Finland strategy that we have done together with the government, the academia, and the private sector. And I think this is very important because it basically sets forth the, the kind of the team spirit, the goal, what you want to reach in your country. And uh, it defines easier also the roles of the different players. And, uh, and then, um, naturally, the businesses and the research side uh, have a very, very important and crucial role in bringing the activities forth. But from the government perspective, um, what the role is, like I mentioned earlier, it was the legislation and, to a certain extent, the innovation. But uh, not the innovation for innovation's sake, but innovation in order to support the growth of the businesses. And for example, in Finland, uh, we do a lot of funding in very tight collaboration with the private sector. It's roughly 50-50 match uh, between the private sector and the government sector. Um, and uh, in many cases, there's also venture capital investments included and angel uh, funding included. 
but that's all aiming to the, towards the same goal that's uh, pretty often set in those national strategies, which have been formed together with all the players. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and my question, I knew that, uh, uh, I knew the state-owned initiative in uh, Finland, but uh, I was exactly looking for your statement on, at some stage you bring the private also together in the in the game to develop to help develop the the economy the real yes. let's yes, say the real economy that yes. is yes yes of course i think uh, of course the, the i think the key is in the private sector but uh, when you're talking about innovation especially in this digital age the technologies and developments business models and logics are changing really really fast so uh, especially for the startups uh, it really is a risk to try new things so what I think uh, one of the roles that the governments can take is to buffer that risk, to enable their startups to, to try and fail and try and eventually succeed. And uh, there it's also important to have this collaboration with the private sector. So we, for example, uh, been uh, supporting in the early days uh, something called Slush which is one of the largest venture capital uh, events in the world. It's started by students, university students. It's still mainly driven by uh, um, you know, people who want to give their time for free of charge. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Chad, in US, we know, you know, it's lots of things going private sector and you have to take a risk and it's, um, a mindset. On the other hand, some of the departments have some government participation. How do you describe this public-private partnership? Sure. Quote and quote. Well, my organization, as I mentioned, is founded and driven by the private sector, but within the reality that innovation takes place in partnership. And so while the majority of our work is private sector supported and driven, none of our work does not engage public leaders, so whether we're talking about the future of advanced computing, the merger of energy and manufacturing, the future workforce skills, we make a very concerted effort, and we've done so for 33 years across different parties and different administrations. So that's who we are and what we do. Now in terms of sort of proper government role, I think we would say three things where we see the federal government has to play the lead. So I want to focus there. One. Fundamental investment in research and development, basic. That is not going to be funded by the private sector anywhere. That's the mega trend of the past half century. Bell Labs no longer exists. Fundamental research has to be, that seed corn has to be planted by the federal government. So that's one thing, and that's something our members have been focused on, and, 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 and a very um, balanced portfolio. It can't just be, all in health sciences, it can't just all be in the physical sciences. We have to find the right balance. So that's one thing. Two, the federal government has a really critical role in procurement. It can play a transformational role to help launch and support um, burgeoning industries. We saw that in the semiconductor industry. There was the Department of Defense who made that happen. Government still has a really important role to play there. And then finally, just to echo something Hannah said, um, risk reduction. In the United States, when we see small to medium-sized firms reach 100 to $150 million in sales, they're s swallowed up by China. They face a valley of death in the United States that they cannot fund. They can't get that sort of bridge funding to that next level of development. Government can play a role in partnership with the private sector there. So those are just three quick ways, um, I would say. But to be blunt, fundamental basic research, that's the core role. Thank you. Pierre, a participação do governo. Você disse que vocês tiveram no início lá do Porto Digital a área, né, prédios, etc., para vocês ocuparem. Como é que foi isso e como é que tem sido agora? Já muito menos participação, mas como é que é essa relação com o governo? Bom, nós, nós fomos constituídos através de um recurso é, pela privatização da, da companhia elétrica que foi feito lá atrás, no final da década de 90. É, foi aportado, na época, 30 milhões de reais que foi justamente o que possibilitou o início do Porto Digital. 
Esse recurso ele foi basicamente para restauração de três prédios, dentre os quais um deles é o prédio da Secretaria de Ciência e Tecnologia. Então, a gente recebeu um prédio que é o CESA, né, o principal centro de inovação nosso, é que ocupa, e um para o núcleo de gestão do Porto Digital. E, a partir disso, a gente começou, na verdade, a pleitear alguns equipamentos e fazer sua restauração, porque ela está na área histórica, que é uma área preservada. Nós recebemos, no total, entre investimentos públicos e alguns privados, algo em torno de 300 milhões, no total da história do Porto Digital. Nós não, vemos, não estamos mais recebendo recurso público para se sustentar. A gente se, tem hoje, na verdade, é, o financiamento... A gente consegue se sustentar é, de maneira própria. Metade dos recursos através do aluguel desses espaços, e real estate, e a outra metade através é, de projetos, muitos deles internacionais, que a gente... É, acaba fazendo de inovação dentro do nosso núcleo de gestão. É, o que a gente acredita é que, a partir de agora, realmente, os governos, não é só o governo de Pernambuco ou o governo brasileiro, eles perderam completamente a capacidade de investimento e que a gente precisa sobreviver, basicamente, de recursos próprios ou através de projetos que fiquem de pé do ponto de vista de sustentabilidade. Então, por exemplo, é, a gente já sabe que há uma dificuldade de formação de mão de obra, então, a gente está partindo, por exemplo, agora para formar nossa própria mão de obra. A gente se associou a duas universidades, a Universidade Católica e a Tiradentes, por exemplo, são cursos pagos e a gente, na verdade, se sustenta daí. E a Fundação Dom Cabral, que, na verdade, está, fazendo, está se instalando dentro do Porto Digital e fazendo a pós-graduação. Então, esse, por exemplo, é um projeto que a gente acredita que fique de pé. O, os projetos que dependem de governo, basicamente, dependem hoje só para contrapartida. Então, por exemplo, hoje a gente recebeu do governo de Pernambuco a contrapartida é para fazer uma creche que a gente vai fazer, não vai ser uma creche pública, mas vai ser uma creche gerida pela prefeitura, mas a gente está fazendo o prédio com recursos da FINEP que a gente conseguiu. Então, o recurso, o governo faz o quê? Só dá a contrapartida e a gente vai passar para eles administrar. Então, mas é uma operação basicamente privada hoje. O governo participa com quatro dos 19 assentos dentro do seu conselho, e é minoritário, e é bom que seja assim, para que essa política, é uma política pública, privada, com alguma participação pública, mas que permanece independente dos governos e independente da situação fiscal do país. Excelente. Bom, nós vamos ter que começar a fase final do encerramento, e eu fiz uma pergunta para eles, porque eu não queria colocar ninguém aqui numa saia justa, uh, se eles se sentiriam confortáveis em dar uma sugestão de uma ou duas coisas que eles enxergam que o Brasil poderia fazer para melhorar essa situação de desenvolvimento de ecossistemas de inovação. Quando a gente se compara com outros países, a gente está muito atrás, a gente tem certamente casos como o do Porto Digital e outros que a gente tem pelo Brasil, mas a nossa posição de 64º no Índice Global de Inovação, acho que diz alguma coisa, a gente precisa acelerar esse passo eles são ótimas referências do que está acontecendo e a gente tem visitado os ecossistemas mundiais. Dentro da MEI, a gente foi também a Israel, foi a China, etc. Justamente para a gente tomar contato com o que está sendo feito lá fora e, com toda a humildade do mundo, a gente copiar, sim, o que está sendo feito, bem feito lá fora. Então, eu queria pedir aos nossos painelistas aqui para que coloquem uma ou duas coisas que o Brasil deveria estar tá fazendo para acelerar esse processo de inovação através do desenvolvimento desses ecossistemas de inovação, pela experiência de cada um de vocês. Pela sequência, eu vou começar pelo Pedro também. Então, eu acho que uma das coisas que é muito importante é a estabilidade. Então, eu acho que o Brasil tem que investir mais em estabilidade. Senão, os investidores investidores vão ter um difícil time em investir no país. Então, Uh, and uh, around that, I think labor laws, tax, a lot of those those things are really important. The second is is uh, investment. Brazil has a lot of a lot of uh, of money, but there is very little investment in venture capital. So you have to uh, make this asset much more attractive for family office, for institutional investors, for corporations, because without without a really big investment on venture capital, it's very difficult to fund these new ventures. A third thing will be 
openness to open the country and international cooperation. Brazil is a, tends to be a closed economy, so this international cooperation, uh, open innovation with other countries, with startups, with other regions from uh, all over the world is really important. So to uh, establish these partnerships, uh, it's, 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 it's really important. And, and I think the, the last thing you already, you already uh, mentioned is, is uh, in, in talent. So it's very important to, to attract and to have great talent in, in Brazil. Um, but I, this will be my, my, my quick suggestions. Obrigado, Pedro. E, na verdade, essa foi uma questão, porque a Beta já expandiu em vários países, e Portugal, que é um país irmão do Brasil, está começando só agora. Então, tinha que haver alguma razão... Essas são algumas das razões pelas quais eles estão começando agora a investir, porque a gente tem que fazer um pouco de lição de casa também. E essa lição de casa é público-privada, né? Quer dizer, a gente tem que trabalhar os dois lados aqui. Hannah, your view, please. Well, uh, I, I would have many things that uh, I would be very excited uh, to, to see happening together with Brazil, because I think you have a uh, fantastic um, solutions and, and activities already here and uh, we will be very excited uh, from a European perspective to continue collaboration with you but the two things um, the uh, maybe one would be to really foster the collaboration uh, on the innovation front between the large enterprises and SMEs including startups and research and academia because I think that's the really only way to foster long-term sustainable innovation growth. Um, and you can have various mechanisms to do that, um, uh, different kinds of innovation funding support, but also mental change, uh, including the mental change uh, in startups as well as in large companies. So consider that maybe working together, bringing your niche know-how to the table and start sharing that is something that could really bring you forward. And then the other issue is related to education that a colleague here was talking about earlier. Um, I know that you have fantastic universities and really, really high skilled uh, education uh, system in the technological front, for example. So foster that and enlarge that but don't stop it there. I think very important thing to remember now when you're transferring into digital uh, economy is the lifelong learning. Think about the truck drivers or, or, or people who are used to operate machines behind the wheel and suddenly they be been giving a touch screen and they have to operate those same machines but maybe 20 or 50 at the same time from a distance. How can they do that? That's just one example. Or think about artificial intelligence. To many people, that is a swear word. That's something that will definitely take away my own job and I will have no future. Shouldn't be like that. So start educating people from youngsters to the elderly about the positive sides of, uh, of technology. And uh, I have a gift from Finland uh, to, to you. There is a, a course on artificial intelligence called Elements of AI. It's free, so this is not a sales talk. <laughs> um, and I think it's most likely already been translated to Portuguese. If not, uh, it will be very soon. So Elements of AI. Thank you. Thank you. Chad? Okay, two quick things. One, sustained, stable, actually preferably even growing, support for Brazil's innovation institutions, number one. Two, energize, catalyze, support, bolster CNI's May initiative. Brazil needs champions, and those champions need to be vocal, visible, and even more powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Oi, veja. Uh, Eu nem vou falar do, da melhoria do ambiente de negócios, de estabilidade política, que esse é lugar comum, acho que todo mundo deve estar falando disso aqui no Brasil. Mas eu acho que a gente... Veja, esse, esse é um mercado global, onde as conexões são globais e as produções também são globais. Ou a gente trata a educação com seriedade, ou nós não iremos sair dessa situação. 
Quando eu estou falando do tratar a educação com seriedade, eu falei aqui, por exemplo, no caso de que muito pouca gente se forma na área de tecnologia em, eh, em comparação, por exemplo, a outras áreas como pedagogia, direito, administração. Esse é um fato. Mas eu estou falando de educação de base. A gente não vai conseguir eh, colocar o Brasil no século XXI de maneira competitiva, enquanto só 48% das pessoas sabem que termina o ensino fundamental sabem ler e menos de 40% sabem o mínimo de matemática a níveis, a níveis aceitáveis. Então, a gente só vai conseguir se colocar no século XXI tratando a educação de base a sério. Isso tem que entrar numa agenda de governo de maneira definitiva, porque esse é, um, esse é o real problema nacional que nós temos hoje, e, e a gente só vai conseguir sair dessa situação realmente num grande mutirão governamental com as pessoas participando. Eu acho que esse é o caminho que a gente vai, é, que a gente pode trilhar ali, encarando, veja, educação como um problema econômico, não apenas como um problema social. Perfeito. Eu queria, parabéns, queria agradecer muito a participação de vocês, Chad, Pedro, Hanna, Pierre, realmente trazer as perspectivas, parabenizar o trabalho que vocês têm feito nas suas instituições e pensem sempre no Brasil. We need help. <risos>